My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I would like to welcome you to the evening services for Sunday, May the 29th. We will be singing uh, four songs. We'll partake of the communion, and I will have a lesson for you that I hope will be uplifting. And so if you would, we're singing from Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, I will give you the number, but I'll also give you the name of the song in case you don't have that book. Uh, you can Google it, or if you have another book, and uh, you can sing along with us. The first song is number 578 in our book, and the title is, We Will Glorify. We Will Glorify. 578. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. If you are in Songs of Faith and Praise, it's the very next song, number 579. The title of this song is Praise the Name of Jesus. 579, Praise the Name of Jesus. Let's sing it through twice. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, if you would turn to number 366, the title of this song is By Christ Redeemed. By Christ Redeemed. Three sixty six by Christ redeemed. By Christ redeemed and Christ restored, we keep the supper of the world and show the death of our dear Lord. Until he come, his body given in our stand, his seen in this memorial brand, 
And as we drink, we see the blood until he come. And thus that dark betrayal night, with the last advent we chain of loving right until he come. As we gather about the Lord's table, remember uh, uh, the last uh, term in the song that we sang is until he come. And I believe that's talking about Jesus coming back uh, his second coming. And so we get to celebrate, uh, each Lord's Day as it is, uh, it is, uh, instructed to us in our New Testaments. And we gather about the table and we commemorate the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. Um, we know, uh, and the song, I think, uh, explains it well. It is by Christ redeemed and Christ restored. We keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord. Remember, he gave his body in our stead. And as we uh, drink, we see the blood that he shed for each of us. And so uh, let's, uh, let's just remember that as we gather about the table that Jesus gave up his body, that he shed his blood, uh, the innocent body, the innocent blood, that we can await his second coming so that he will judge us and that we can live with him forever. Uh, this is the time and when we gather about the Lord's table that we just uh, come into a closer union uh, with our God and uh, we come into that closer union to his son who he allowed to be sacrificed. Let's pray now for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we just can't explain uh, the magnificent sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us, that his body wrecked in pain, hanging upon the cross, was indeed given in our stead. And he did this all because of your divine plan, that Jesus would come, give himself up, raise from the dead, and come again to return us uh, back to you. Bless us as we partake of this bread. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray uh, for the cup, uh, the blood that Jesus shed for us. Again, it's difficult for us to fathom the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And as his blood uh, poured from his head and his hands and his feet and his side, we remember that that blood was shed for us, an innocent one giving his life up for us sinners. We know that through his blood sinners, we can have our sins forgiven. And we just pray to Heavenly Father that as we gather about your table, that we will recognize the depth and the magnificence of the sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us, that uh, while we were yet sinners, that uh, he died for us. I pray that you would be with us bless us. I pray it in his most holy name. Amen. As 
a matter of convenience at this time, we do also what has been instructed to us through the New Testament, and that is to give back as we have prospered. Uh, we indeed have prospered and uh, just help us as we lay by in store that uh, our giving back to the Lord will always be first because we just understand that we give back to the Lord that which is his. We understand that we come into this world with nothing. We leave this world with nothing. And we understand that uh, the work of the church that Jesus laid down his life for uh, was to uh, have unity and to bring others to the Lord and be benevolent and serving people in our lives. So bless us in our giving. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we have the ability and the desire to give. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give you but your own. Help us to understand that Jesus gave his life for us. And what we give back is a token of our love for the Lord. Help the monies to be used to bring others to the Lord. Help the monies to be used to uh, uh, be kind to those that are in need. Bless us in our giving. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And the last song that we'll sing before the lesson is number 580, <laughs> The Joy of the Lord, 580, 580, The Joy of the Lord. <clears throat> the joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. He gives me living water, and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I hope the Lord enjoyed our singing. I hope you were able to uh, participate with us. And uh, I just pray that um, uh, we will uh, all be uh, strengthened through our praise of the Lord and that we will always uh, praise his magnificent name and that uh, you would bless us in that praise. If you're there this morning, you probably noticed that Jane and I were not there. Uh, we both tested positive for COVID so we decided it was in the best interests of everyone if we did not share the wealth, so to speak. And so uh, you can't get it through YouTube. So uh, everybody's okay uh, for our evening service. Uh, the title of, uh, of uh, the uh, lesson this evening is a, hopefully a provocative one. Uh, I have called it Escaping Earth. Escaping Earth. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, after Adam and Eve had sinned, after they ate of the tree, that uh, 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 they were instructed not to, uh, we know that uh, they had to exit Eden. Eden was supposed to be this wonderful place. Any of you who do uh, crossword puzzles find that this idyllic place is always this four letter word Eden is, is recognized as this wonderful and glorious place. And Adam and Eve had this and they had it within their grasp, yet they uh, could not resist the temptation of eating from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from. 
And it said that in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, that Jesus literally cursed the ground. And when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, they were now expected to toil and work from the ground uh, for their daily bread, for the food that they eat, uh, for the shelter that they made for themselves. And he literally cursed the ground. Now, what is earth <laughs> for each one of us? Well, I might uh, say something that might ruffle you a little bit, or uh, it might provoke some thinking on your part. However, this terrestrial place that we call earth became a prison of sorts. Um, I believe that man was supposed to live this idyllic life, but with the sin came decay, suffering, pressure of all kinds, temptation, guilt, pride, and many other uh, products uh, that, uh, or, or behaviors, I should say, that are the products of man's behavior. All of those things are products of our bad behavior as we made bad choices. We make bad choices in our life, just as Adam and Eve made a horrible choice. Now, this dynamic caused King Solomon, the writer of many of the Proverbs and the writer of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And if we wrap up uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, it caused Solomon to write about life's vanity because he summed up life that way, that all is indeed vanity. And what Solomon did in both the Proverbs and in the book of Ecclesiastes is he spurred his readers, and that's, that's you and I. He spurred his readers on to look and identify the benefits that come from looking beyond the physical. Because what he said was that everything in life, all of the physical things are vanity. And so what he's saying to us, and, and we're going to get to a, a really, really important scripture here that I know all of you are familiar with uh, in just a little bit. He said, rather than being conformed and restrained terrestrially, you know, by what happens here while we were in, are encased in these bodies of ours. We ought to excel to a celestial state of mind or a spiritual state of mind. The 20th century philosopher Pierre de Chardin once wrote this, and I'm going to quote it, and I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. He said this, and see if you agree. You are not a human being in search of a spiritual experience. Rather, you are a spiritual being immersed in human experience. We are spiritual beings. When God said that man was created in his image, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. It is not in the physical image of God that we are created, but rather in the spiritual image. And so what dominates us is our spiritual 
as the spiritual part of our lives. Now, unfortunately, we are encased in a human body that is able to, unfortunately, through our minds, make choices and sometimes incorrect choices. Now, our, the spiritual side of us might say, ooh, ooh, don't do that. But sometimes the physical part of us is so powerful that we do these wrong things instead. Now, remember, we are a spiritual being immersed in a human experience, encased in this human body. And so when it says the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, that's exactly exactly, exactly what it means. The Spirit lets us know what we are supposed to do. The human body is supposed to follow suit. The human body is to take the spiritual part of us and run and say, this is the part that's really, really important. And the spiritual part says, don't engage in these things. And allow the, the spiritual part of us to literally overpower the physical part of us. Now, I contend, and, I, you know, I don't come by this in my own finite wisdom, but in the infinite wisdom of the words of the scriptures. Satan uses three primary tactics to make you or try to get you to forget about your spiritual nature. He tries to convince us that we're not really spiritual, that we're just physical. And because we are physical, we should engage in anything that we think we would like to. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, they are laid out for us. When Satan tries to get us to forget our spiritual nature and be just totally enmeshed in our physical nature, he appeals to the lust of the eye, to the lust of the flesh and to the pride of life. These are tactics seen throughout the history of man. Biblically, it's what Adam and Eve uh, succumbed to, the physical part. Even though God said, don't do this, God appealed to their spiritual nature. He said, your spiritual nature through me, because I said, don't eat of this tree, should be powerful enough when you're near the tree, you can say, okay, there's fruit on this tree. But God said, I'm not supposed to eat of this tree. So Adam and Eve succumbed to it. In Josh, in the book of Joshua, this man Achan, uh, in Joshua, uh, chapter seven and, uh, verse one and starting in that, uh, that area, the, the Israelites were not able to defeat, to defeat Ai because they sinned. Achan, when told to take everything and destroy it, kept things for himself in direct contradiction of what God had told Joshua for the people to do. And so, Achan had a spiritual nature. The spiritual nature through Joshua said, don't do any of this. Yet, he did. So, with that in mind, we live on this earth we live in this world. Let me go back to my title. How do we escape from it? 
how do we escape from being earthly? How do we escape from being worldly? I'm going to go to a very, very uh, familiar passage for all of you. It is in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. And we're going to skip the first famous verse and go to the second verse. The second verse of the 12th chapter of Romans says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that may be, you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I would maintain to you that within this scripture, there are three ways for us to escape worldliness and to escape this earth. The first is, don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. When the Apostle Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, he <laughs> You know, lets us know that we can be conformed to this world. We can be conformed to the uh, lust of the eyes and to the lust of the flesh and to the pride of life. And he says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't limit yourself. Paul is indicating that this is your choice. Don't be conformed. Don't limit your mind. Don't limit your abilities to only being worldly. But think on a higher plane. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, it says, For I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is revealed to us. Paul was thinking on a higher plane. He says, whatever happens in this body is like a grain of sand on a seashore. It's only one infinitesimal little part to what eternity is all about, is to living with the world, for uh, with the Lord forever. And so let's not limit ourselves Let's not be conformed to the world. Second, sometimes we need a jump start. The second part of Romans chapter 12 uh, in verse 2, it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, our consciences can be numbed by the things that go on in the world. People that advertise products for us try to numb our minds to get us to buy their own products, their singular products, as to whether it is better than the other products. They numb us to the, uh, to the point where they almost say, you don't have any other choice but to do this. Any of you have been in a dentist chair know that you've probably gotten a shot and, and the shot has numbed a part of your body so that the dentist can work on it and uh, we won't feel the pain. It doesn't mean that that part of the body is not there. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. This agent just put some numbing agents in there dulled the nerves so that we didn't feel that which was being inflicted upon us. When we get back to normal, if, if the dentist did, uh, did throw some pain, uh, things in there, uh, the pain will return. Reality will come back. Our consciences are just like that. We can be numbed. You know, we can be numbed by that, uh, that anesthetic and we can't allow that to happen in order to 
understand this, we need to understand the origin of our mind. We need to see things as God sees them. And you say, whoa, whoa, I can't. Yes, you can. Genesis 1.27 says that we are created in the image of God. We are spiritual beings. And we can see the spiritual side of this. And so when we start seeing things as God sees them, this is the very, very moment that things become more visible to us. The real things that are important. Three, the third part of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 is all about remembering God's will so that you may prove what the will of God is that is good and acceptable and perfect. When we don't limit ourselves, when we renew our minds, what we do is we come to the understanding of what the will of God is. And then we say, I'm ready to do your will, God. It is possible that our time and our energy can be spent on vanity. Solomon wouldn't have written that whole book of Ecclesiastes if this were not possible. It's also the will of God, to find the things in life that are good and are acceptable and perfect. And God spurs us on to do those things. Do the things that are good. Fill your mind with those things. Do the things that are acceptable and do the things that are perfect. You know, our actions play a significant role in who we are, for they are the fruit of our heart. James is not the only one that says, you know, show me your faith and I will show it to you through your deeds. This is biblical teaching going all the way back to Jesus's teaching. Let's look at what Jesus said in uh, Luke chapter uh, 6, verse 45. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil side, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Wow, those are significant words. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart does good things. When we do good things that we're supposed to, it is out of that good part of our heart, that spiritual part that tells us these are the things that we should be doing. And it's not so with the evil man. Because the evil man out of an evil heart will do things that are evil that he should not do. And let's not, you know, and, and James talks about the tongue also. Let's make sure that we understand that we, when we say things, they're more than words. The words that we say are those things that come out of our heart. Now, the world's end is destruction. We know that the world will be destroyed and we have a new world that we can go to. Therefore, the glory is incredibly limited because this earth, just as our physical bodies, will pass away. The Father's end is non-existent and has a glory that literally supersedes men's comprehension. And so Romans 12, 2 is a verse that reminds us, and hopefully we will 
continue to allow it to serve as we continue our daily walk on this terrestrial domain. Because we can escape the worldliness. We can escape the uh, earthliness because our spirits must be dominate, dominating in our lives. That verse says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to the physical part, but allow the spiritual part to reign. That's the glory of being a Christian. The glory of being a Christian is when we rise up from the waters of baptism, our sins have been forgiven. God has forget, forgotten the things of our past. And we get to walk in a newness of life because we, through baptism, get the gift of the Holy Spirit that lets us know within us the things that we should do and lets us know that we should not be conformed to this world, but we are to, to renew our minds and remember as we renew our minds to understand what the will of God is. If you're not a Christian this evening and you, you have read and you have understand what it takes that you must confess, repent, and be baptized, we're ready. We're at a telephone's call. If you get in touch with us, we will help you in your next step uh, to becoming a child of God. I hope this message has been beneficial to all of us. And I pray that uh, we will think more diligently about the spiritual aspect of our lives. Let's all pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, you are a part of our lives. We're grateful that uh, we have the, the gift of the Spirit and that the Spirit can help us not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of our spirit. Help us not to limit ourselves. Help us to be the spiritual beings that you want us to be, that the spiritual aspect of our lives will overpower the worldliness and the earthliness, that we can indeed escape earth and our lives. Continue to be with us this evening. Help us to look forward to the next time that we get to gather together in your name. Continue to bless us, always comfort us, be with those that are less fortunate than us. Help us as their brothers and sisters to uplift them in all gentleness. Continue to be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. I hope all of you will be safe and may God bless you all.